I know. It's like with you wearing all black, you just really look like a head bouncing around the screen. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining this. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting of the Isla Vista Community Services District. I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, Jonathan, can you call the roll? Director Brandt? Here. Director Aguilar? Here. Director Bertrand? Here. Director Freeman? Here. Director Topliff? Here. Director Deschler? Here. Perfect. And uh, Director Flaherty is absent tonight. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Chumash elders, past, present, and future, call this place, Anascoyo, the land that Isla Vista sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Chumash community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Next, we're gonna to move to the consent agenda. Do any directors have items that they'd like to pull? Not seeing any, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move for, um, for approval of the consent ag agenda. I'll second. That's the right thing to say. Yes, that's <laughs> correct. Made by Deputy, <laughs> seconded by Topliff. Um, is there any public comment on the consent agenda? Jonathan. Just wanted to give a note on the consent agenda, which is for the approval for the funds for the spring festival. And that was something that Director Topoloff and I talked to them about, which is uh, paying 25% now and then 75% uh, once the event is complete. So just it's a, it's a little different than what our contract originally said, but we talked about it and this made more sense uh, for the state of things. Thank you for that. All right, so seeing no public comment on the consent agenda, uh, we'll move to roll call vote. Director Brandt? Yes. Director Freeman? Yes. Director Topliff? Yes. Director Bertrand? Yes. Director Deschler? Yes. Director Aguilar? Yes. All right, motion passes. Next, we're going to move to the public comment period. This is the time for any member of the public to speak on any matter that is not on today's agenda. Um, if you have a comment for something that is on our agenda, you may speak during that agenda item. But for all items not on today's agenda, please hit the raise hand button or put something in the chat and we will call on you. Are there any public comments? Uh, I'll go over to Mark. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, I, IBCSD board. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I just wanted to bring to your attention that I uh, sent an email to all of the board members and, a general man and the general manager about some um, mobility legislation that's going through Sacramento. And if any of that um, interests you all and getting, uh, getting a letter of support would be really valuable in the process of getting some of these bills passed. Um, there is a, uh, some of them are replays from last year, but some of them include free transit passes for all people under age of 25 years old, um, you know, other stuff that includes pedestrian safety infrastructure and decriminalization of other acts. And so I would just recommend you take, out, take a look at that list and, and see if you can submit any letters of support um, as, and vote on it as a board, obviously. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mark. Next, uh, do we have any other public commenters? Well, we had gotten that letter. Do you want to address that? I, I did. I was going to have Jonathan speak to that in a second. Um, okay. Seeing no other in-person commenters, uh, go ahead. You, you want me to read the letter? Sure. That's what they wanted. Um, okay. I write this letter. This is from Julia Barbosa, who is on uh, the Park District as a board member. Uh, to the IVCSC board, I write this letter as an Isla Vista resident and utility taxpayer. I became aware while catching a replay of a previous IVCSC board meeting that a Deltopia festival is being planned on April 2. 
via IVCSD funds. I was unable to make a comment at the time the topic was discussed as I had not been aware of such plans beforehand. I noticed that in the staff proposal for the festival, the following quote was used. And then it goes and cites our um, memo that talks about our measure R and what it mentioned about community facilities and events. Um, however, despite the intentions included in the measure R language, the delineated powers by LAFCO as they currently stand do not reiterate the text above. They specify the following. One of the CSC's activated powers is, and then it lists the um, community facilities power, acquire, construct, improve, maintain, and operate community facilities. Um, their limitations on powers are, importantly, the district has two explicitly stated rec uh, limitations on its powers. One, which is not the power of any eminent domain, and the other is to not supplant the level of services provided by the county, IVRPD, UCSB, or any other provider. Regarding eminent domain, the limitation is straightforward. The district does not have the power, and since there is a specific provision against the exercise of this power, the only way for the district to obtain the power would be via legislation to amend section 61250 to delete the limitation. Um, I can appreciate the sentiment that safety measures around an event with notorious destructive ramifications are needed. Thankfully, the festival ordinance has proven to mitigate a good deal of those issues on the weekend of Deltopia and especially the weekend of Halloween. It does appear to me that the event, even in its current form, stated goals and place of execution, extrapolates activated powers as well as oversteps the stated limitations. For this reason, I ask to kindly that you reconsider this expenditure of funds, especially of this magnitude on this event. Thank you for reading that public comment, Jonathan. And um, I think that we have another public comment uh, to be read as well. Um, I'm not sure if you need to read the full article, but maybe just in reference uh, and just state for the record that it has been distributed to uh, board members. Carmen Lodi sent an article about CEQA legislation and about student housing and exempting that from review. And it's an LA Times article. But thank you he did not request it to be read. All right, thank you for that, Jonathan. Uh, Director Freeman. I just thought I would point out that the um, Due to the nature of the material that was in Julia's comment, I feel like it would be or would have been applicable to the consent agenda item um, where we did the action that she seems to have been commenting that maybe we should reconsider. Uh, in that light, I, I will I would like to respond to one aspect of it uh, at the end um, that 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 idea, um, which is that at this stage of the game, my understanding is that. Work has already been being done on this, and it would be like we can't just not pay for the thing that we've now agreed to do, and uh, uh, and it's already started to process. They started processing, and so sadly, uh, even though my, I am personally sympathetic towards the idea of being like, no, we should not do this. Um, I voted for pay because it's we should pay our obligations and our debts. So, thank you for that, Director Freeman. Okay. Um, and so are there any other public comments? I see we've had one more person joined us who emailed us a letter. Uh, Carmen, did you have a public comment that you wanted to share? Okay, uh, seeing none then, uh, we will close the public comment period. And uh, we are going to move to the first discussion and action item, which is the Goleta Valley Library update. Hi, may I share my screen? Yes, you're good to go. Great. Can you see it? Yeah, please put it in present mode though. Awesome, thank you. So thank you for inviting me here tonight to give you an update on the Isla Vista book van project. Um, 
we'll start with some brief facts. Uh, my presentation is a little bit different than the one I emailed you earlier. So um, some of the brief facts, we received a $200,000 California State Library grant, thanks to Senator Limon. We purchased a Sprinter van and made modifications for it, to it and purchased a starter collection, computers, furniture, and other items that would allow us to provide mobile library services to the Isla Vista area. We also purchased four little libraries for installation throughout Isla Vista, and those little libraries are regularly restocked by library staff each week. And a book return um, drop was purchased for installation at the Isla Vista Community Center. I'd like to share with you our current schedule. We have a rotating um, biweekly schedule. And so uh, right now we have two different shifts. One is the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday shift at the Ivy um, Community Center. And then the other one is a Tuesday, Thursday, Friday shift, which visits a number of different sites. And then we repeat every other week. Um, this is our uh, winter schedule. We're going to be changing to a summer schedule for June through August. And I've got some statistics for you. So um, this is this captures the stops from October through February. So five months of stops. Um, the, the spaces where you see that we only visited five or six times, that's because there were a number of Thursday holidays in November. And so that, that punished Sea Lookout and Perfect Park and West Campus Playground, unfortunately. There were also a couple of rain days, so we were unable to visit while it was raining. Um, but I've listed by um, the largest number of interactions that we get per visit. So Isla Vista Elementary School is by far our most used spot. We visit there for three and a half hours every other Friday. And um, we average, let me just move my... Um, picture here, uh, we average 67 contacts per every visit there. Studio Plaza Apartments is our second busiest stops. We stop there for an hour and a half, and we see at least 30 people every, every time we stop there. The Teen Center and Estero Park, we see 25 people. We're there three and a half hours. We sort of combine those two stops as one. UCSB Early Childhood, we see 19 people, or they are an hour and a half. We see 18 and then at 0.5 people at West Campus Playground. Friendship Manor, we see 18 people. We're working on trying to figure out a better day for that stop because Fridays they often have outings. See Lookout Park, we see 18 people in the hour that we're there. Um, but we're starting to see the numbers really pick up for that stop. 17 people at Perfect Park in the hour and a half that we're there. Stork Community Center, 10 people at average in the hour and a half that we're there. And then unfortunately, Ivy Community Center, we're there the most. We're there a minimum of 3.5 hours on Tuesdays, and then we're there five hours on Mondays and Wednesdays. And we only average 9.5 people per day. We're often lucky if we have three interactions in an hour. Um, so the disappointing thing for us has been that the UCSB and SBCC students have really been uninterested in our services. Um, we get a lot of foot traffic going by the community center, and we've been really assertive in calling them over to the book van to come see what we have. And um, they're like, no, I don't have time to read, or no, I don't have a DVD player. 
I stream. So then we say, well, guess what? We've got all these great free downloadables. You don't have to pay for them. We've got movies, we've got TV shows, we've got music, books, um, graphic novels, comic books. And they're like, no, I've got Netflix. I'm fine. I've got Spotify, not interested. So um, we have a handful of university students that use our services, but it's really just a handful. I had put a lot of extra money um, from the library's budget into a service called Hoopla, which has really great downloadables because I thought we would see a lot of usage in this area from Isla Vista students once they heard about it, but they just aren't interested. So um, this stop is kind of ineffective for us. Some of our challenges, $200,000 goes a lot less far than we had hoped. Uh, we had to modify the vehicle, fuel, insurance, materials, staffing is the huge cost. COVID has affected things. Um, so we've had supply chain issues which have prevented vehicle modifications. So we were supposed to have an electronic, electronic lift that would um, allow us to put a book cart on it and it would lift it down to the ground and then we could push it off. Uh, we, it's still on a barge somewhere off LA. So we need two people on the book van at all times to be able to just physically lift the book carts off and then lift the bins full of books off and then lift them back on at the end of a visit. Another issue we've had to deal with is um, particularly at the community center stop, um, we've had uh, itinerant populations um, threatening, showing threatening behavior to the book van staff, intimidating them, throwing things at the book van. Um, so I have felt that it has been a safety issue and I've not been comfortable having less than two people on the van. So we've had to staff it with twice the amount of staff that we had originally intended. So I tried to mitigate the cost of that by having two library assistants, which is a higher paid position, and then two department aides, which is a lower paid position. Unfortunately, the result of COVID has been that it is definitely a job seekers market. And um, McDonald's is hiring people at 1750 starting an hour. Our department aid position starts at 15. Um, we've been really having trouble attracting people to the position. We finally got some people to apply <laughs> in the last couple of weeks. So we're really hopeful that um, we will be able to staff the vehicle. So as a result, um, the library has done a huge amount of in-kind donations in order to keep the grant going. For example, I have been on the book van for a large amount of time, well over six weeks. My management assistant was on for six weeks and she continues to do one day a week. We do not charge that to the grant. Um, we are using library time. Um, the finance department staff keeps track of everything for the grant, library administration um, time for filing all the paperwork, for selecting and ordering supplies, all of that which was intended to be, which was originally intended to be part of the grant funding, we have um, made that in kind donations. We've also donated books, DVDs, and other circulating items, as well as the craft kits and other giveaways that we hand out to kids and families at all of our stops. So we have um, given a lot, as much as we can, um, to keep the book van running 
and really had to put as much of the money as we can into the salaries line um, to keep it going. I had a meeting with Jonathan uh, last week, I think it was, and he had, I was telling him about the issue with the students not really using the van and uh, asking if maybe we could take one of those three days that were at the community center and visit other sites instead. And he suggested that we consider maybe staffing um, a study hall at the community center on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, four hours uh, a night. We figured we could do from 4 to 8 p.m. I could provide a um, wireless printer for student use. And uh, Jonathan said that you have tables and chairs there. As long as um, someone would promise to stay with my staff member and help her close up so that she's not leaving the building alone, um, we would be certainly willing to do that um, in trade off for not having the book van visit. That would allow us to have the book van continue the visits to the other sites a little bit longer. Um, while we try to come up with a solution to continue to fund this test pilot through the grant period, which ends June uh, 2023. So that's one thing that we can discuss today, if that's a possibility that intrigues the board. So um, despite pushing all of the remaining budget into salaries, we really sat down and crunched the numbers today. And this is the number that's different from what was in the uh, PowerPoint I sent to Jonathan earlier today. We can, uh, if we do the study hall and then staff the book van with a library assistant and a department aide, we have enough money to run the thing through September 23rd of this year. And then uh, we would spend, I would spend the summer pursuing corporate funding and private donations. Um, we would offer to some of the corporations in the area in return for putting their logo on the side of the van um, for a certain you know, donation level. We think that we could raise some funds that way for staffing. Um, and then also approach some of the private foundations in the area. We would also ask the county for some money to help fund the rest of 22-23. And any suggestions that you have would be more than welcome because we definitely wanna keep this going. We're getting great response. We've already served well over 3,000 people um, with these visits. We're happy that we can at least get through the summer reading club, but we definitely want to keep this going, um, but we need help. And um, so we're, I'm just asking for any input that you may have and uh, that I can bring back to the city or that I can take with me and ideas that I can run with to um, achieve more funding for this really great project that we have. And so I'm gonna to try to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Okay, um, well, thank you so much for the presentation, Allison. Uh, it's really sure. great to see you. Um, I'll, I'll just say off the top that um, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from Isla Vista residents about how much they love this service and they love having it in their community. One person that I was in contact with uh, is someone who has a mobility impairment and uh, being able to uh, get over to the Goleta Valley Library branch is not something that's uh, super feasible for her and to have the services just blocks away as has been really helpful. And um, I know as, as a neighbor of the book van uh, at the community center, you know, living on Trigo, it's been really nice to have it in my backyard as well. So yeah, good. Just, that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, 
really quickly, um, I, I, I have a couple questions, but I, I want to do a clarification on what your proposal is uh, in terms of the study hall. Um, so would that involve the book van continuing to be at the location? Um, we wouldn't be able to because I would only be able to send one staff, excuse me, I'm so sorry, my allergies are terrible today. Um, we would only be able to send one staff member. And so um, what we would be able to do is we would be able to register for library cards. Um, we would, so we would be able to um, also um, look things up on the computer that students need and we would be able to deliver holds there each day and we would be able to um, provide access to the downloadable materials got it um well thanks for clarifying that and i know you mentioned this is something you've consulted our, our staff with but i guess at least i had a different understanding i guess of what the proposal was coming into today um, um I, I don't know if jonathan if, or you or allison want to speak to that yeah, I guess I had thought the book van was still going to be there, um, but I just learned it wouldn't be. But I, I thought, yeah, we but really, I just didn't know that from our talk. We really only have the recreational materials on the book van, and the students just haven't been interested in them. So, in terms of um, a study hall, I don't see where they would be useful. I think the um, you know, access to the library databases, maybe the reference databases might be more useful. And I believe you have wireless at the community center. So our staff member could help students with reference questions and research and things like that. And then we would have the prevent the printer, we would provide paper um, so that they could print out research and, you know, papers that they're writing and things like that. Well, thank you for sharing. I've got a lot of uh, more questions and comments, but I know uh, I want to give our other board members a chance to speak as well. So I'm, I'm going to hand it over. Uh, I see a hand from Kirsten. Go ahead. Okay. I, I couldn't lower my hand and talk at the same time. Um, so I have a couple questions. Um, I want, and I'll just rapid fire. <laughs> um, where is the Stork Community Center? You know, I'm not sure. I've never been on the van when it's visited okay. that. It's um, it's at San Clemente, I believe. Okay, so it's serving the student community. Campus house. UCSB yeah. students, okay. Um, and then the studio apartments, where is that? I've never been on the oh. van for that oh. one either. I'm it's, sorry. it's on Camino del Sur and... Um, and a brego ish okay so is that primarily studio Possibly. apartments is that so when when we're when i was listening to your presentation i hear you say students and so students can be elementary school students and students can be college age students and so i'm trying to differentiate between that so um so studio apartments it would just be interesting to know the age um because it, at Isla Vista, Isla Vista School, it would be elementary school. That's kind of a captive audience. Uh, the students, the young students are there when the book van comes. Um, and I just, I'm interested in the studio apartments, who that is serving, if that is college age students, or if that is um, elementary. I, I, I'm asking because you, um, on both studio apartments and the, and the school, you, you get a lot of people that are really into yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Studio apartments, um, we get families, mm -hmm. we get stu um, college students, mm -hmm. um, and we also get parents whose kids are at school at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then at the um, teen center, of course, we get teens. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It seems like uh, well, actually, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pontificate right now. I'll wait for that. Um, the next question I have is um, does it have to be Department um, Galita City of Galita staff that staff the book van? Uh, yes, I think for insurance purposes. Although um, we could probably investigate volunteers at some point um, to be the second person on the van. It's just that it's hard to rely on volunteers to um, be there on a steady basis. Once we get that lift, 
-hmm. whenever that is. Um, and, uh, you know, we would be more able to be flexible, mm -hmm. but until we get that lift, it's really uh, hard work getting those book carts off the book van. Um, they're very heavy. They're about 40 pounds each. And then, you know, all of the books too. So until that happens, it has to be library staff. Okay. Um, and then the last question I wanted to ask you, um, I do remember you coming last year and giving a presentation, but I wanted to ask you about how the funding for library services works in Isla Vista. And the reason I'm asking that is because my understanding is the book van is essentially providing library services to the community of Isla Vista. And so by Isla Vista being a part of the Goleta Library, Isla Vista gets that service. And what I hear you saying is that there was this $200,000 grant, most of it's going, a lot of it is going for the van and for salary, and that funding for the van will end unless there's corporate support in September of 2022. And what I, what, so my question is, how does the community of Isla Vista, which pays for services through property taxes, get library services if this $200,000 is a one-time um, one time grant. So that, that's what I'm trying to understand is just how the funding works and, and, and how Isla Vista can continue to get um, services that it pays for in the absence of any corporate philanthropy. Right. We do receive per capita funding from the county um, for the Isla Vista. It's uh, this year, I think it was, um, $7.84 per capita. Um, that funding has always gone to support the main regional library, Goleta. Um, and so it's part of Goleta Library's general fund, uh, not general fund, but the funding to run that main regional library. So it's always been part of that budget. It's never been a separate part of the budget. So, um, you know, we, that's how it has worked. But I, I see your point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm just so basically in absence of this 200,000, how do services get provided to Isla Vista? I guess that's what I'm trying to get a sense. And maybe you don't know. <laughs> and that's okay. I don't have an answer for you on yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. I, that's one of the things we would like to discuss with the county. Um, okay, um, it, it would just help me in this presentation or help me in general to when when we're referring to students um, as if they're college age students or elementary students, because I think that will help in terms of understanding where the highest usage and and I would ask my colleagues um, when to provide a service like at the Community Center for UCSB Santa Barbara City College higher ed students, is there a value to have um, a printer and somebody to access the computer. That seems very basic and almost something that is done at the library, the UCSB library. So anyways, I just throw that out. I'm, um, I know our expert over here, um, Marcos will answer that. That's all my comments for now. Thank you, Director Deschler. Uh, I'm gonna go to Director Freeman and then Director Topless. On that, on that last comment, uh, I, I, I do feel like if the premise of what's being operated at the community center is a study hall with a printer, that that is not something that really feels like a library service. And, the, the, and like, you appreciate the libraries buffer that and that it's important, but like, I don't really feel like we need to partner with the library to have library staff bring a printer and set it up at the community center in order to offer that service. And then, pay essentially like you know i mean like which is we get into in a second we were, we're definitely have feelings about this about the, the the finances here but essentially like paying through galita in order to have a person come over here in order to do that there's something there's it, it, that feels that, that feels like it's bypassing the the, the gloriness of, of actually being involved with the library because uh, I, I, I guess i i want to then return to and i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of Maybe a little bit repetitive, but I'm gonna. But I feel like it it deserves to be said again. Is some of the questions from from Kirsten? So I would like 
first of all, like to clarify a little bit. So you said that funding for the book van will run out in September. What will happen to the book van after that? Are you saying that some of the locations that the book van's going to will not go to? Or are you saying that the book van will become a, uh, will be stored in the parking lot and just not be used for um, At right now, yeah, it will stop operation unless we figure out something, which I'm hoping we can figure out something. But, but as of now, it will stop operation on September 23rd will be its last day. Okay, I, I, I guess I guess that just that feels a little ridiculous to me to to, to have this this it was it took a long time too right I mean it was just like it was this incredible amount of time spent to procure them at large capital expense in order to operate it I guess you felt and I did not I was on the I was on the library board during this time I did not get the impression this is how it operated that it would only be operating due to the grant funding and then would be mothballed at the end of the grant funding process. Um, I mean, this this doesn't this just doesn't feel like an, a, an effective use of, of any of that money, much less a, a fair usage of what, what, what Isla Vista, I feel, deserves on of library services. Um, Isla Vista does, to be clear, pay for a lot of funding from the county for your library service. I mean, it's the reason why when we were originally looking into doing these uh, uh, you know, the, the, the advisory board, Isla Vista got a seat on your advisory commission uh, was in order, to, was because of the amount of funding uh, that was being put forward by Isla Vista for, uh, for library services. And I, I guess I just, the feeling that I have continually gotten through this process, this is from when I was on the library board continuing through today, is that the Goleta Library just considers there's the service that they're operating in Goleta and then this grant money, which was supposed to come in in order to, 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 to bootstrap and maybe provide some supplemental services in order to, to really get us to a point where we'd be able to, 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 to like, you know, maybe the infrastructure costs of things like buying the book van, of buying, um, uh, I mean, you, you, you really wanted the vending machines. I think you ended up getting some of like, like a, lot, a lot of this stuff was so that we'd be able to continue having library presence based on the funding that we're already paying. And so I, it, 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 it just, it feels really wrong to me that you come to us and then say that you're going to go to the county and ask the county how, the, how to, to, to provide library services to Isla Vista. I feel like the answer from the county should be the money that we're spending you that should go, to, that we're sending to you, that money should go towards library services in Isla Vista. And so I, 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 from that standpoint, I feel like really what what I would be kind of expecting, and, and maybe maybe there's a good answer here. I'd be clear. I mean, I, I could, I could, I could, I could. I, I, I'm at a lack of data right now on this, although I have my beliefs based upon both um, my experiences myself and also kind of reading through what you're saying. But I feel like the Galita Library should defend uh, its its uh, this amount of services that it's providing towards uh, Isla Vista residents. And so, as an example, if, if all of that money is going towards operating the uh, the location, you know, the, the, the main Goleta Valley branch library location, then can we get some statistics that show that actually a lot of Isla Vista residents go to the Goleta branch library location? Um, and uh, and, and th that could make us start to feel like, oh, actually we are, uh, our money is going to a good place because it turns out that it's, it we're actually uh, getting a lot of good coverage out of it. Now, my belief uh, is that we don't have a lot of people going there due to a lack of transportation options to get there due to a, um, the uh, the existence of, of um, for, for some of the students at the UCSB library and other some study resources. I feel like the, the, the bringing the library services into Hala Vista was, was actually a key part of what we were trying to get out of the library, not to be clear, not from getting the grant, just from paying the library with money on per capita from Isla Vista residents. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know what we might need to do in order to try to request that. I mean, I, I can tell now to me, you know, metaphorically turning to my board, I feel like um, maybe we should go to the county and and, and make a point about uh, we feel that we're not getting uh, uh, actually served by the Goleta Valley Library and that and then maybe the money that is getting sent to Goleta Valley, we, that we should be involved in a new renegotiation of that contract. Um, if nothing else, I will also point out from that standpoint that I had um, when we were originally discussing having the advisory board, it was designed to be a board that would have actual um, 
budget control over the Goleta Valley Library. Uh, and then uh, after like about like, a half a year of, of, of delay on the construction of that library board, finally I found out why the board had been constructed and it was because um, the Goleta um, had been working with their council on noticing that we would have budget control um, over, over, over the library and that, that clearly to their standpoint wouldn't be okay, even though the point was to have the people who were funding the library have budget control over where the money was going. Uh, and so we ended up, be, instead of being a, um, uh, I forgot that there were, there were two terms, instead of being the term we were supposed to be, I think, which, which I think was a library advisory commission, we ended up being a, um, a like, a, 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 maybe it was seemingly something else. We were supposed to be something else. And we ended up being merely an advisory commission to the city council, who then became the board that we were originally supposed to be. There's just something about this process just feels really unhappy to me. And then particularly, I mean, I, my experience of then being on that board for a long time and having the um, uh, actual action items that we were supposed to supposed to uh, work on continually getting punted forward until finally I was not even on the commission anymore. And so the agenda item I'd been waiting a year and a half and we're going to we talk about finally we were able to come up. Instead, we're working on things like mugs. I, I just, I don't think we're getting the um, respect as a community that is funding this library that I feel like we should be getting. That's my thesis, and that's where I, I don't know where to go. Yeah. Thank you for those comments, Director Freeman. Director Topliff, and then Director Aguilar. You're on mute, Carrie, sorry. I appreciate all the comments of my colleagues, which are certainly a lot deeper and more nuanced than um, I would imagine I was able to be. But uh, the study hall did seem to me like um, something that was not core to what we want out of the library dam. So that didn't seem like a good way to spend scarce resources. Thank you, Director Topliff. Director Aguilar. Yes. Hi. Um, so I want to keep this to questions before we go into like the comment period or public comment period. Um, you mentioned that staffing was some of the concern. Is there still some of the possibility like you and I had discussed long ago about um, seeking part time employees to help with the book van services and the idea of maybe employing some of the Isla Vista's own residents to work? And this, because part of some of my experience with UCSB is hiring student employees and training them. And I know that um, many of our neighbors here in Isla Vista would be very qualified, um, but also very eager. Um, when I open a job app for a similarly not competitive wage um, at UCSB, within two days, I have 200 applicants. Um, and I think that I, the interest is in the commute. It's in the proximity and it's in the relaxation and the comfort with the library. So I think that there are some creative solutions here within our neighborhood to help with the staffing. Um, so I hope that we can explore that. And then my other questions are, I want to, I hope that we can see a little bit more in depth uh, statistics. Um, some of my work with UCSB also involves mm -hmm. collecting statistics and sending them to UCOP um, and stuff like that. Sorry, I'm trying to make that my screen bigger for a moment. Um, and so kind of what Director Deschler was asking about the different age groups, um, it'd be nice if we can either see that kind of breakdown of the interactions or maybe a breakdown on what the interactions are, like how many people are signing up for their first library card because of the book van versus how many people are merely borrowing, um, those types of things. And then the second, a more nuanced type of statistic I would think would be really useful would be um, kind of like Jay alluded to, the number of Isla Vista residents who are traveling to Goleta Library versus the number that are now using the book van service. And if we see a dramatic increase, then I think that the book van is in that sense, a wild success. Um, 3000 persons, served in five months with service interruptions and population interruptions to me is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can, rather than change what's on the drawing board or remove things, just kind of shift some of our strategies around, because um, I think there's a lot of tools around us. 
Thank you, Director Aguilar. Director Bertrand. Yes, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Ms. Gray, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm really in complete agreement with my colleagues. I think folks have brought up uh, great points and asked uh, fantastic questions. That being said, there are some things that um, I am impressed with tonight, and I'll, I'll start there, which looking at the amount of, um, of, of users at Ivy Elementary School um, near Children's Park, um, as well as by the Teen Center, that's very impressive. So good job with that. Uh, one question I have, you mentioned um, in your presentation briefly that um, you're restocking the little libraries mm -hmm. weekly. Um, I'm curious, do you have any numbers about how many books are taken out of those at a time? We, we don't keep track of that because other people restock as well. So we have no idea how much goes in or out. Got it. Um, well, I, I will say I have seen a lot of activity, especially at the one near Little Acorn Park. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like to see more of that. I think that's been a success. Um, but above all, I mean, my, my concern is just uh, IV residents do pay a lot for this service. Um, and it's more than just the state grant. I share Director Freeman's um, concerns about the idea that, um, yeah, it's great that we purchased this van with the state grant, but um, I don't imagine that that van will just be idle at the end of uh, this grant period. And at that time, IV residents will still be paying a significant portion of the Goleta Valley Library's funding. Um, and I'm not sure that many IV residents go to use the service uh, at the main location. So I think it's just so important that we uh, continue to refine how we are going to bring the service uh, to community members. Um, I think what we've identified tonight um, a little bit is that uh, we're meeting the needs of uh, young children and families, hopefully, uh, but we do need to figure out how to meet the needs of other community members. Um, being a college town, a place uh, where we attract so many uh, folks who are academic <laughs> in some way or another, um, we know that there's a lot of interest here. Um, in the past, my colleagues have brought up a number of good ideas, especially President Brandt, about um, just knowing how uh, expensive it is uh, for students to get textbooks and how um, students are always um, so appreciative of any way to get their hands on texts more for, at a more affordable price. Um, as well, there are many professors and lecturers that have gone out of their way to try new innovative ways to provide their students with a more affordable option. I think that's something that we do need to look towards. I know it's not traditional for many public libraries, uh, but we're also a, a very unique community with, uh, with unique needs. Um, so perhaps uh, President Brandt will want to speak on that a bit later, because I know that's been his uh, priority for a while. Um, in regard to the study hall, uh, I do think that it's needed, but I agree with some of the comments that perhaps while it's needed, that's not a function of this program so much. Um, my experience before the pandemic was that uh, whenever uh, midterms and final season uh, came around, folks were scrambling for where they can print their essays. Um, this time around, though, it's all digital. So who knows? Maybe we're not going back to that. Um, but uh, there are different technology needs, whether it's printing, whether it's scanning, um, or perhaps some other um, special technologies uh, that students uh, do need access to because many students don't have printers in their apartments. Um, so all of that being said, like I do think there's more that we can do to cater to college and university students. Um, but I also do want to recognize uh, the success that you have had with uh, younger children and families. Um, but again, just to reiterate, I definitely want to make sure that uh, we're getting Isla Vista residents money's worth uh, when it comes to service. Thank you. If I could just answer the textbook question, I know it's what everyone wants, but it's just not something that we could ever afford to do. Um, classes change, textbooks change. It's just not a function of public library service. It's, it's just not. I wish it were. I wish we could provide that but we would um, need much more than a book van. We would need much more than the building that we have for the public library. So that's just unfortunately not a realistic expectation. 
Yeah, I mean, respectfully, I think we might need to try harder there. It might be partnering with a, a textbook rental service. Um, it might be working on some pilot programs with specific professors um, who are really committed to the cause of providing a more affordable option. But when we have this issue of uh, looking at the Ivy Community Center numbers and just saying that college students aren't interested, um, we really have to do something different. So I'm, I'm going to push us there a little bit. Thank you, Director Bertrand. Um, I, I had a question for you, Director Gray, about the data collection as far as the uh, interactions go. Um, what was the period in which that data was collected? October through February. All right. Um, and, and that, um, I guess I asked that question just knowing uh, for, for the public, and because our, our board knows this, but the public might not, that the community center wasn't operational until we had staff that was able to come online and it was able to reopen safely in uh, January of this year after the after the surge that happened. So I, I just throw that out there because I think that um, the the lack of uh, additional traffic and the fact that the community center is uh, being reopened basically after uh, two and a half years in which even before the two and a half years, it was only open for a couple of you know weeks really before COVID started um as as one thing to think about and and also you know um COVID's been really tough on all of us of course and you know especially in our community it's really torn at the fabric of our community because oftentimes when uh we see surges like we saw in January there's a big portion of the town that leaves and, and goes back home to stay with their parents if they are college students I know that definitely happened in January when there was all online education at uh UC Santa Barbara and I, I would just say that I, I would imagine that that's probably impacting the numbers that we see as well. Um, my first inclination in sort of looking at this proposal um, more broadly is that I don't feel we have enough data or enough time to really make an informed uh, decision about something like this. Um, and I think that uh, more consultation and more uh, cooperation and working together is definitely something uh, that is needed before uh, our board is able to give approval to anything. I know we all kind of got this presentation a, a couple hours ago and are still kind of digesting it. So, um, so I share that feedback. Um, I um, another thing that I, I just want to mention too, to a point that was made um, uh, by by a couple is that um, you know it. I I want to be careful about how we talk about college students because. Um, I think in your presentation, you mentioned that they're just disinterested in, in books and libraries. And um, I just want to be careful because I honestly, it kind of sounds very disrespectful to a very large population of our community, uh, a large population of our community that is very, um, very well educated. They're going through the process of uh, going to college, getting a degree at SBCC or UCSB. Um, and so I just say, again, we should be careful about that. Um, but I, I also, I guess, I want to ask um, if there's anything you can share, I guess, in what your uh, sort of outreach process has been uh, to college students and maybe some successes and failures. You know, you mentioned, you know, talking to people in person, passers-by. Is there any other outreach that you can talk about? I'm sorry if I sounded disrespectful. It's frustration. Um, we we have been really outgoing. We've gone out into the street. We've gone across the street. We've gone to the bagel shop. We've gone around the neighborhood talking to people. Um, we've really been um, very outgoing, approaching students and offering them information about what we have. We've offered brochures. We've offered uh, brochures that, that specify information about particular databases we think might be useful to a, a university student. Um, we've done everything we can think of to um, appeal to the students that we're talking to about all of us services we have, the physical materials that we bring with us, um, we bring library of things materials so like robots and tablets and keyboard synthesizers and just things that we you know non-traditional library materials that we think that they might enjoy 
Um, and then all of the downloadable stuff that we have that's free that, you know, popular movies, music, um, graphic novels, things that we know are popular with this demographic, um, but we're really not getting anywhere. They, they just don't want to talk to us. And I've got young staff that is of that age group that's trying to um, reach out to them. So it's been really frustrating for them, for the staff, because they know all of this great stuff that we have, but we just can't get them over to the van to check it out. Um, we can't get them to try a library card so they could go online and check out the downloadable stuff. We can't get them to, to come on over and look at the keyboard synthesizer, you know? So it's um, discouraging. And there is a lot of foot traffic by that location, by students. And um, my staff is, is very, very diligent in trying to talk to people and, um, it just hasn't resulted in very many library cards at all. And those, you know, we've had interactions with about 470 students and um, we have not made 470 library cards, that's for sure. And, and just to clarify, because I think Director Deschel asked for this earlier, you're talking about college students and not elementary students. Yeah, we're at that location at the community center, it's all college students and university students, yes. Got it. Well, I agree with her comments earlier that it would be really good to see the breakdown of uh, sort of what demographics are being served at these other locations. Because, you know, when when I hear Studio Plaza Apartments, I know that that's purpose built student housing. You know, that's housing that and when I say students, I mean college students. It's it's pre furnished studio apartments for UCSB and Santa Barbara City <laughs> and, and other residents who want to rent it. But that's just how they advertise it on their website and mm -hmm. knowing who uh, the demographic uh, having been a neighbor of that facility in the past. I guess it points to me that that maybe there's some untapped opportunities here that we can help you tap into. Um, and, uh, and and I do wonder if, if maybe uh, working um, with our, uh, or with more in-depth community outreach into some of these pockets at the UCSB and SBCC community, um, including different clubs, um, such as, you know, the reading and writing and book clubs that exist on campuses, um, other departments that are on both campuses could be really helpful because um, it's great to hear that we're spreading flyers and we're, you know, going and talking to people directly. Uh, in my day job, I coordinate volunteers to go and talk to people directly. And I'm always, you know, pushing the mantra that, you know, that's the most effective way of doing things. But it might be more efficient if we did direct outreach and built relationships with the natural users, I guess, of a service like this. Uh, you know those those uh, eager readers. You know, as a starting point. So just well, I just wonder if maybe um, fifth, approximately fifteen hours a week at the community center is not the best use of our time. Maybe if we were on site at UCSB, maybe in a couple of sites one day a week. You know, on a Monday or a Wednesday, maybe that would be better uh, if we could identify if you could help us identify um, a couple of sites where maybe there would be more attraction for the students um, you know i'm we would love to do, to try anything that would help entice the students to use our services you know that's what we're trying to do we feel like we're kind of twiddling our thumbs at the community center three days a week. We would love to take one of those days, and that was what I had asked Jonathan, if we could take one of those days and use it better at some, uh, you know, two other sites. And we would love to have a presence on UCSB campus if someone could help us figure out where that should be. I, when we were trying to set up sites at the very beginning of the project, I reached out to a bunch of UCSB different groups on campus and I didn't get any responses. So that's why we are not anywhere 
on campus except for at early childhood. Um, so if you could help us with that, we would be very grateful. And we would love to, if you would agree, change from one of, you know, be at the community center two days a week, but maybe on Wednesdays, split the afternoon and go to two sites on UCSB campus. That would be great. Well, it, it's definitely lots of process. Uh, I think it's definitely more to think about. I'm personally not sure how I feel about it. <laughs> uh, but, but I'll just, I'll add one more thing too, which is that, you know, looking at your, the data, um, you know, you've got the community center location, which has the lower number, um, which is obviously what we're talking about. And we also have Perfect Park, which is literally right next door, and it's got double the number. Do, do you have an idea or any theories as to why that might be? I think my staff thinks it's because the um, Amazon store is across the street. Is that correct? Yeah, well, the Amazon streets stores across the street from both of them. They're next door to each other. Yeah, they feel like they get a lot of the traffic directly from the Amazon store at the park. Got it. OK, well, thank you. I see my colleagues have uh, their hands up. I'm going to go over to them. I've got some comments that I want to make further. But first, I'm going to go to Director Deschler and then Director Freeman. OK, so Alice, can I call you Allison? Which, what do I call you? Allison? OK, so what I know about you having worked at the city of Goleta and having worked at UCSB is that you are an immensely creative person. And I always appreciate that about you. Uh, what you have done with the Goleta Valley Library is so impressive. The programs that you offer, it's, it, it's just always astounding to me. And I think what a cool job you have. Um, so I know, I really believe like we can get there. Um, in this process, and I think this is just the first step in kind of understanding the scope of the problem. It seems like there's really two different issues, two issues here. One is trying to get more student, young and higher ed students involved with the library and partaking in the services. And then the other issue is this ongoing budget issue. So, um, so let me just tackle the first. The first is, I am your representative to UCSB. You can contact me and I will help you. That is my job. So um, I would love to help you. And, and I think you and I did work together when you were putting in the little digital library at the USEN, for example. So I can help you with that. I want to help you with that. I think that there's some ways that you could probably uh, peak interest in um, the book van by having it on campus and then moving out to Isla Vista. Um, to the community center. So there might be some opportunities there. So I, I definitely would like to help you with that. But I really want to go back to, and, and I think that my colleagues may agree, we may want to form a smaller subgroup to kind of flush out some of these issues and then come back at a later time. But I really, so all that is said, what I really want to ask you about is the budget, because um, I don't understand it. I'm, I have read the Newshawk articles here and there talking about the budget of libraries and how the service areas are changing. And, and Goleta has gotten say, say as and, and Isla Vista and, and, and broken apart from the Santa Barbara. What I want to understand is when you look at if the per capita expense or per capita is $7.84 for each resident of Isla Vista. And I, on my understanding is that would be the Isla Vista box, right? And then that would be UCSB students as well. So we're looking at probably what, 25,000 people approximately. And then you look at the city of Goleta, which is latest census, I think 33,000. It really gives you a sense of looking at these two entities. We are not a small contributor to the library. We are about equal as the city of Goleta. And so, and that's probably roughly maybe $200,000 a year. So I, I guess I throw out to you that, um, I really want to think beyond, we, we definitely have to increase people's interest and access to the amazing materials that you're offering. And I, and I can really see how I can help with that at, 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 on campus. But I also want to say, it's not okay, in my, my opinion, to say, oh, county, we need some more funding. My understanding is the city of Goleta is responsible for the Goleta Library. And isn't it the city of Goleta who is responsible for allocating um, the different library services to the community. So that's a question and a comment all wrapped up together. 
So our population for the um, Goleta Library is 112,000. Um, so um, that's the area that we cover. That doesn't include Solvang and Buellton, just so you have that number. Um, yeah. But I would love your help with UCSP. Thank you. I will contact you. That'd be great. Appreciate that. And before I go to Director Freeman, I do want to just clarify something because I uh, I want to make sure we're working with the right numbers here. Um, and there was some question about how much is the per capita. So the base is seven dollars and eighty cents per resident. Last year, the county increased that funding to be nine dollars and twenty five cents a year. No, that's incorrect. That's they, what, it's the county budget. No, last year we got seven dollars and eighty four cents per capita. Okay, so maybe the county budget document is wrong, but this is what I'm reading from their website, so. Wait, let me just double check. No, 804, I'm sorry, 804. And this year we're hoping to get 830 something, but they haven't voted on it yet. Got it, okay. I just wanna point out, you know, it says right here, Include $658,700 in additional ongoing cannabis funding provided by the Board of Supervisors to county branch libraries for the fiscal year. We so, do not get that funding. That I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, main branch libraries do not get cannabis funding. It's only like the branch libraries like Solvang and Buellton, uh, Carpinteria, uh, only branch libraries get that. Main libraries do not get any cannabis funding. So they may have gotten the $9 per capita, but main libraries like Santa Barbara, Maine, Goleta, Santa Maria, Maine, and Lompoc, they got the lower per capita. But the per capita funding is for unincorporated residents. Is that not correct? It is is but we do not main libraries get the lower amount they do not receive cannabis funding so only branch libraries get that funding so even though we have unincorporated areas in the Goleta service area we're considered a main library we do not get the extra cannabis funding whereas Solvang and Buellton do do we think it's fair no we do not <laughs> that is why uh, all of the main libraries would love to get some of that cannabis funding because it's of no benefit to us to run branches. We don't make any money from doing it and our, our patrons don't benefit in any way from it. So we would love some of that extra cannabis funding, funding every year that the other branches get to, to balance their budgets. But we do not get that. So I think that's where the $9 figure comes from. Got it. Well, that's helpful to understand. I apologize for not being completely updated on the policy. No, it's I, very complicated. <laughs> and I, 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 I do just want to point out, this is not uh, meant to be a comment to you because this is not a decision that you make. But, um, you know, it, when we're talking about asking different groups for funding, um, you know, I think that it's one of those things where, um, you know, th there needs to all be a part. And I do see that the county is increasing funding. And, uh, I do see that that uh, funding is provided to the Goleta Valley Library for the purpose of serving uh, residents of Isla Vista. And just by back of the envelope math here, it's about $200,000 per year, which is, you know, largely, it's the same amount that was in the grant that was uh, from the state libraries. So, um, you know, I, I, I look at that and I think our board looks at that and it's hard not for us to say, hey, it looks like the resources are there. And it's just a question of priorities. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that it's much more complicated than that. Um, but I just, I'm, I guess I just want to say explicitly, I think where we're coming from, you know, when we look at that dollar amount. Uh, Director Freeman, you had your hand up. And I'm sorry, I cut in line in front of you. I don't mind at all. I have uh, three things, short things to add to the discussion. Um, one of which is I, um, we've been talking a little bit about the location of the book van and the, um, the different places in Isla Vista and the types of constituents that tend to go to different places. And I will note that I mean, the Studio Plaza Apartments itself uh, might be a student housing um, uh, targeted. I, it, it's, it's a location, I'm, I'm presuming, with a 
accessible parking lot or like the place you could you could put a van. So it is across the street from Children's Park, and it is right next to um, all of the um, uh, housing on Abrigo. And uh, I, I know I mean, it's increasingly students over the years, but a lot of a lot of families were um, were at, at, at the sweeps. Uh, and that, that area is stereotypically has a lot of families in it. So like you want to say that I I um, can can see the the concept that that location ends up targeting families um, potentially better than our community center currently, although I could see that changing in the future as we have uh, programming with the community center. And the community center only really opened you know, four months ago, right? I mean, it's just like we're, we're not ready to, to, to decide yet, um, uh, in some sense, permanently with the, um, how people treat it. Um, the next point I wanted to make is I wanted to provide a clarification. I'm saying I was talking earlier. I was just like, wait, so this this term this term that was used for the board versus this term, and I couldn't. I looked it up to make certain so I could provide uh, the the specifics. Um, so when we were originally working on the, um, um, getting representation on the Galita Valley Library. We were discussing having a board of trustees, and that ended up being an advisory um, an advisory commission, and the. Um, the, the, I'm going to read actually the paragraph that I got from the lead about it. Of particular importance, we recently received information from our attorney pertaining to the way the, Goleta, the city of Goleta established its library board of trustees through an ordinance previously adopted. Per the education code referenced in that ordinance, a library board of trustees has the power to hire and fire library employees, set compensation rates, and purchase property. All of these duties go beyond the original intent of the county and city of Goleta when the Board of Trustees was originally established through that ordinance. To correct for the inadvertent error and to uphold the original intent of the five-member board, your role will be in the capacity of a library advisory board representative of the Goleta Valley, sorry, Goleta Library Service Area, and the Goleta City Council will serve as the formal library board of trustees. In other words, your role will not change, just your collective title as an advisory board. However, we do recognize we'd like to apologize for this oversight, especially because it caused such a delay. Now, I, I read that. I will point out that my understanding from before this email was that we would be a board of trustees and that that was actually part of the intention of setting it up that way because it is often something you do where if there's, a, if there's groups that are funding something, you put them in charge of things. That, and that's that was my impression and uh, the uh, uh, it felt like a unfortunate extra delay in order to uh, juggle around responsibilities. The, the final point I wanna make is, so I'm not saying this is, I'm not saying this is true. I wanna I want posit if it's true for a second and I wanna ask other ramifications of it. Let's say that it is the case that students don't use the library and in general, Isla Vista residents don't use them. Given if that statement were true, and we, we've been getting feedback from, from uh, and by the way, I'm, by the way, if, if I were in the room, this is important context, if I were in the room, I would not be looking at my board, I would actually be looking at Allison. Um, if this were true, why are we spending money on library services, right? Like the, the, process, uh, and, and I, I want to defend why people keep coming back to um, what is a creative thing we could do here? Maybe we should think out of the box. What is a service that we could provide to a student? I, for what it's worth, have been in the past even very sympathetic towards the idea that maybe textbooks aren't the place. But if we have a lot of students in the area and they're paying a pretty large amount of money for library services, we should figure out library services for them. And that, that and if we're not going to figure out library services for them, if we're just going to decide they don't seem to like libraries, then maybe we shouldn't be taking money from them to fund libraries. And that's, that's I think, where you start getting this kind of pushback on, well, we're just not going to help them. We couldn't figure out a way to help them. And you start getting all these questions about, well, can we find a service that does it? Isn't there some way we could serve them? Maybe we could just try something here. Is there something creative we could do? Like there's all sorts of attempts at kind of scavenging, like, um, scavenging, kind of like um, uh, those make, 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 put something together here in order to actually make this work. Uh, and and I, I, I just, again, I want to, I'm not saying that that's true. I'm just saying that if that were true, we, we wouldn't just not do libraries, and take their money, so. Thank you, thank you for that, Director Freeman. Um, and I, I think there was another hand up. Was it you, Director Bertrand? Yes, thank you. Um, 
on a on a different topic, I was going to mention um, this year, as we just discussed at our retreat this past weekend, um, as a district, we've really enhanced our public engagement and communications capabilities. Um, and in looking at our social media channels, I've seen um, the Goleta Valley Library office hours or van hours advertised. Um, However, I went and looked um, at the Goleta Valley Library's Instagram, and perhaps um, you post some of the Isla Vista content there. But um, in general, if we do want to reach our community on this, uh, social media is going to be the best way. Um, and it can also be a way for us to engage to learn more about what people want, um, especially with this group of students that were college students that we're trying to tap into. Um, so I don't want to. Uh, volunteer our team to do that but I know Jonathan can help um, speak with you to see how we can support um, just greater uh, social media engagement and um, really getting to to college students um, and young adults um, about uh, the different uh, things that they may be interested in seeing um, just hearing your description of the library of things items um, sounds like you have some awesome supplies there um, that people just don't know about. Um, and I know in the past, we've also discussed like art supplies. It sounds like you have some great music supplies there. Um, there are a whole bunch of student orgs um, at UCSB that um, have musicians who are always looking to get their hands on new things. So um, I think uh, with what Director Deschler said about helping get the word out on campus more and um, with us helping with uh, some social media as well, um, hopefully that can help uh, generate some new users. Thank you for that, Director Bertrand. Um, well, I'll, I'll echo that and close on a, a positive, which is I also agree that um, we've got a lot of opportunities here. Even just uh, speaking with Marcos the other day, he sent me a tweet uh, that was like, uh, it, it was, it was I think it originally intended to be just a, a joke or a, in in jest, but it was, you know, this idea of what if we did a literacy program for young adults and uh, gave uh, free pizzas away when you uh, completed a book, you know, things like that. I mean, and obviously that it's, it's made in jest, but it's to say that I think that especially now and especially uh, during COVID, a lot of uh, students and young adults really rediscovered their love for reading. Um, and I, I think we've got a big opportunity here. And I know it seems like we're getting closer because I'm it seems even just from living near the property and, and seeing uh, slowly and surely the numbers going up uh, that we're on uh, somewhat of a uh, we're making some progress. And uh, I also just really want to say thank you to our community center staff who initiated the uh, the coffee hour or the uh, I don't know exactly what the uh, the correct terminology for it is, but the um, the cafe that is there on Mondays as well in concert with the library. And uh, I think that that is kind of uh, the type of thing that you were maybe originally thinking of when you were talking about the um, study hour as a uh, something that can be used to help augment the existing services. And I'm very supportive of that. I've been that student that sent a crunch to print out my paper um, or just needs a quiet place to go. Living in a house with 12 people in three rooms, it's kind of hard to find quiet space sometimes. So I think there's potential there, um, but I think that it needs to be done in concert with the existing services and the existing uh, book van stationed there as it is and as was sort of agreed upon in the council direction from City of Goleta City Council. So um, I guess th those are my final comments, um, but um, I, I also, I, like I said, uh, I, I know we've been, uh, we've had a lot of ideas, uh, some, some critical, uh, some positive, but I, I want to end on, on the positive note of just really emphasizing that uh, I have spoken to many Isla Vista residents who love the services that are being provided and, and want them to stay. And I think it's definitely a big question for our board about how can we advocate to make sure that these services do continue to stay in the community because i'm very worried looking at that fiscal cliff as well as i'm sure all of you are and and, and want to find a solution uh that allows us to preserve these services um so so those are the end of, of my comments but thank you allison for being here and providing us with this update thank you i appreciate it director aguilar 
Yeah, I was just going to ask if we, if this is the type of item we should go to public comment at all, since we did kind of, just, there's a few folks here, either Mark was here earlier even, um, or not. Yes, th thank, thank you for sharing that, Marcos. We got so caught up in all of our ideas. <laughs> um, I'll open up public comment. Any members of the public who'd like to speak can hit the raise hand button, or they can put something in the chat and we will call on you. Hi. Hi, I'm calling in on my phone, so I can't raise my hand. So if there's a line, I would just like to join it. Go this ahead. is Maya, by the way. Hey, Maya, um, go ahead. You can speak now. Hi, so I hopped in a little late on the presentation, but I did get to hear the second half. Um, and I just wanted to comment saying that I've been doing the Books on Wheels Cafe, and I've heard that you know, some mixed reviews, some people that come by, they really enjoy it, but I know that the numbers are still low at the center. That being said, um, I will be, I would be willing to work with Allison in any way to ensure that we can market this better for our community and keep this as a resource, even if that is, you know, maybe transitioning a little inside, having study hours and the long side, um, the book, the book fan. So um, I just wanted to say that my line of communication is always open. For anything I can do to help at the community center and just to let me know and I'm happy to do whatever I can. Thank you very much for your comment Maya and and thank you for all your work uh, bringing the community center to life. Thank you so much. All right are there any other comments from members of the public? All right seeing none I'll close public comment. Uh, any other final thoughts from our board? Dr. Aguilar. I uh, can't remember exactly which one of us on the board had mentioned there being like a group to kind of think of some new ideas that are more focused for the Isla Vista community. Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time or if we can take that kind of action or not, but in the future or now, if that's available, I would definitely be interested. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Marcos. I, I think Director Deschler brought that up. I, I agree that that's a good idea for us to put together a, a group of the board to um, help work through some of these things. And um, I don't think we're agendized to take that action tonight, um, but uh, I think we can work with staff to bring that back on a future agenda. Okay, then with that, uh, I think we're going to close this item. Thanks again, Allison, for the presentation. Thank you. Good night. All right. Um, we're going to move to item 4.2, which is the undesignated fund balance discussion. Hey, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. So for this, there's no formal uh, recommendation or anything. The purpose of this discussion is to help since the retreat on Saturday is to get the board's uh, temperature and direction on on those undesignated reserves on how the finance committee and staff should work with them during the budget process. So we'll talk about any ideas or do we even want to open this up or not today? And then um, we'll go work with the finance committee to come up with some specifics and bring it back to the board to actually consider but it's you know i think today is more do we want to spend some of the undesignated uh fund balance yes or no um and then if so what's the kind of scope we don't have to decide on a figure but you know what's the scope on uh, anything that's uh brainstormed today so we can take it to the finance committee to make more specific. So just a reminder, we had 955,000 uh, available uh, separate from our designated reserves. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Uh, and just a reminder to everyone, the Finance Committee is myself, uh, Director Bertrand and Director Topliff. So uh, I'll hold off and wait to hear from my colleagues. Uh, Director Deschler. Okie dokie. So, um... <laughs> I'm sorry, that last item, I mean, literally, I'm like rubbing peppermint oil on my temples because I have such a headache. But anyways, okay, so um, 
So my thought, okay, I have a one question. Is this like a one-time lump sum? Is there any ongoing um, of this fund? And, and then my other comment that I wanted to make is that it seems like a more natural time to consider um, this fund after we get the presentations by our various uh, programs as part of the regular budget. So I'm not sure how that all fits into to the timeline, but it seems strange to me to recommend um, um, ideas for this funding when we haven't heard of some of the presentations from needs from our various programs. FYI. Yeah, those are just not going to happen for like three more months. So trying to get some uh, ideas or openness to the use of it. Sometimes, some years we said no, we don't want to use it at all. So. Uh, if we want to have it open, we want to have, you know, are we, are we going to be open to it or not? Okay. Uh, so then, so then my next question is, is this ongoing or is this one time? Because one of the issues that we talked about was staffing needs um, at the, at the retreat. And so would that be something that we would propose or because if this is an ongoing funds, then it, it's a different calculation, right? It's, if it's one time, it'd be not staffing, for example. No, it's, it is, um, it is one time money. So you could do it in a way where um, like, like other things where you, you give some to get something started and then the funds can grow, you know, revenue can grow to fund it later, but that's, that's not something where we can calculate right now, but uh, it's just one time. But for example, I think last year the we did use nine thousand in our budget for this to um, allow for the third day of service for board members for stipends. Like that's what we used our undesignated fund balance for last year. Uh, thank, thank you for that, uh, Jonathan and Director Deschler. Are there other comments from board members? Director Bertrand. Sure. I mean, I guess two things come to mind first. Um, one of them being identifying some capital improvements uh, that um, are some bigger ticket items, um, perhaps having to do with the community center, as an example, um, some things that we've wanted done for, for a while. Uh, perhaps it's lighting enhancements. Um, perhaps it's some other sort of um, infrastructure improvement um, near our facilities. Um, another idea that we briefly discussed during the retreat and in committee is um, on public safety, um, trying to do some things different. Obviously we have our safety stations program and interpersonal violence investigator. Um, but in the past as a board, we've also discussed um, the SNAP type program, student neighborhood assistance program, or some sort of um, program that uh, deploys helping professionals uh, with law enforcement to be out in the field uh, on weekends, whether that's an alcohol and drug type counselor, social worker, etc. Um, so I offer those as just two ideas of some things that we may want to consider, whether that's a capital improvement or a pilot program um, to enhance our current level of public safety services. That being said, I'm definitely looking forward to um, hearing the feedback from the community budget survey. I think that's going to be very helpful as it has been in the past. Um, and I appreciate the points that Director Freeman brought up at the retreat about how we want to make sure we're being intentional about who we're asking what information and making it um, representative of the community, if I remember his idea correctly. But um, what I'll also mention is I appreciate staff uh, bringing this um, at this time, because while it is early, um, there was clear agreement, I think, among uh, our board that we do want to move this money and put it to good use. Um, so that's my thoughts right now. Thank you for that, Director Bertrand. Any other board members have comments they'd like to make? Not, not seeing any, I'll uh, share uh, some feedback because I, I agree a lot of uh, uh, what both Director Deschler and Dr Director Bertrand said. Um, I, I really see the opportunity here um, kind of de facto 
the fact that we have allowed the fund balance to grow to what it is, is, is kind of saving, you know, for, uh, I don't want to call it a rainy day because it's more than a rainy day. I think it's, it's, it's saving money, uh, that is one-time funds, which I think the best use for that is capital projects. Um, and, uh, I, I would love to see us sort of in acknowledgement of the fact that we continue to be a growing organization, um, that we continue to be taking on more responsibility as far as potential capital costs in the future, whether that's the community center um, or other programs. Um, I would like to, I think a great thing would be for us to designate um, some of that money uh, for a sort of a long-term capital fund. Maybe that's augmenting our existing reserve uh, to put more funding in there. Um, I, I think that that would be um, a very uh, fiscally responsible thing to do. I also agree that uh, some of these shorter term capital projects are definitely things that we should pursue, um, whether that is the community center, whether that's lighting, uh, whether that's other improvements to other services that are these one-time funds. Um, but I'm also open to seeing if there is a way, we have some unique staffing challenges right now uh, due to um, just the nature of how staffing works and being a small organization. And even though I wouldn't uh, usually say that I'd support using one-time funding for uh, an ongoing cost, I think potentially there is a way to um, help utilize some of that one-time funding to ease us into additional uh, ongoing costs for staffing. Um, our organization is operating at 130% of its 100% capacity right now. And uh, that's something that uh, we need to address as a board in order to continue to provide quality services to our residents. And so I think that uh, potentially we can get creative about how we use the one time to augment a future ongoing expense. Any other comments from board members? Director Dashler. Yeah, I um, just want to say I really agree with you, Spencer. I, I think the idea of setting aside some funding for capital expenses for things that we may not know exist yet um, is really a good use of funds. Um, and the other thing I, I was really impressed with um, the community center update that we got a couple weeks ago. And um, I think the, there's some issues there. I think that definitely there could be good use, good funding, uh, good use of funding. Um, and then one thing I wanted to say is that one thing that we consistently are hearing is that people don't know what the IVCSD is or what the IVCSD does. And I would I would say to Sydney, I and I would I would put this to Sydney and I would also say this could be a good use of one-time funds is to think about some things that IVCSD can do to help uh, promote awareness in the community. And I'm not sure what that looks like. I mean, it could be signage. It could be um, the CSO um, safety stations being rebranded. I, I mean, I don't know, but that's why Sydney's the expert. I just wonder if there's some um, opportunities that we can promote the IDCSD to the greater community in um, a way that is a little bit more um, splashy. Sorry, I know Ivy is the antithesis of splashy, but um, that's what I, that's, that's my idea. So there you go. Well, we do have an ocean, so you're not too far off. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also just want to say, I agree. I think it's a great idea. I've loved the stickers. I've got one right here and a couple more on my desk. So um, yeah, it, it, certain things like that, that we can do, um, I think now is, is the right time for that. Other comments from board members? Okay, I have one more comment. And yeah. I had to ask, <laughs> I had to ask Ross if I could say this. Um, so I think that with some of the big um, capital projects that may come up, uh, depending on conversations that we are having with the county, there may be a need for some expert advice um, uh, given to the district. So I would say that I think that there may, we may want to think about um, looking at hiring a, a, a con some type of professional um, to give us advice on some of our capital needs coming up. And 
that's all I would say about that. Yeah, I would just respond. Um, we definitely probably need to do that if we wanted to do capital improvements like that, because we had thought that maybe partners uh, or not partners, management consulting can do it, but they um, they can't. And they suggested we go and find someone else to hire, like what you just said. So that that probably is would be a good idea is to invest in that to help us figure it out. Yeah, th thanks for that, Jonathan. And I know this, this is a topic that came up at our retreat as well, the idea that if we can get sort of a, a capital plan, um, I know it's tough because with some of our, uh, well, our biggest uh, capital lease, the community center, we are still in ongoing negotiations and don't quite know where everything will fall yet. But um, I, I also see uh, that as being a, a good use of one-time funds. Any other feedback from board members? I'm not seeing any, so I'm gonna open up public comment. If there are any members of the public that want to speak, you can hit the raise hand button or put something in the chat. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, I think this is um, been a good discussion. Um, and I'm sure that, uh, as Kirsten mentioned, as we continue to see more of the program reports, it will help kind of, I guess, jog our thinking, get the, the wheels in our brain turning to say, okay, this is something, you know, that is an actionable project that's sort of on the table can be accomplished with one-time funds that we can see that could potentially be prioritized. Um, and um, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. And I know the finance committee appreciates everyone's, everyone's feedback. Um, so thank you. So we're going to close this item and we're going to move. Wow. Only two items on the agenda. We're going to move to reports. <laughs> um, any reports from board members? Director Topliff. Well, I wanted to report on my attendance at the Isla Vista Recreation and Park District board meeting and um, tell you some of the things that are going on over there. They're uh, just as busy as we are and uh, getting a lot of things accomplished. I was certainly very impressed in all the different things that I heard about. Um, out on West Estero, they're putting uh, the fourth concrete tee pad down. So they have a golf course out there that is apparently very popular. And um, also installing LK water fountains to refill water bottles. And also two of them will have um, uh, dog water bowls as well. And uh, they look like they're very impressive and they're gonna be a great uh, addition to the community. Um, another thing I heard there is that uh, Luis Valerio who has been serving as their recreation coordinator uh, competed successfully for the job of assistant director, which was uh, widespread recruitment. And so he is going to be holding that role now. And I know from my uh, few interactions with him, I found him to be extremely impressive. And of course, uh, the district has put on some really great events recently. So I, I think that he'll be very successful in that role. They're uh, doing some movies in Anascoyo Park on April 28th and May 26th. They have their uh, spring concert series starting up, I think this month or next month. So uh, they're busy with that. And then they had a very interesting presentation from a geologist about blufftop erosion, which I'm sure uh, people are aware has been a problem. And when actually some of the numbers are looked at, it's, it's pretty shocking. Uh, they looked at things between 1998 and 2016 and saw a 15-foot retreat on uh, the Pescadero uh, parcel, a uh, window to the sea, a six-foot retreat, and a 17.7-foot retreat on the Rodapel property, which is uh, predominantly owned by the county. 
So their uh, practice has been to just pull the fences in as the erosion occurs. And now they're wondering if uh, actually the act of putting those fence posts into the ground is potentially exacerbating the problem. So they wanna be very careful about how they do that. And then because the majority of that cliff top bluff um, park property is owned by the county, they're feeling that there's a necessity to work in partnership with the county. And the county has not really shown an interest in uh, paying attention to anything where there's not a building at risk. So uh, they're just wondering to the extent that they're going to have to take the initiative on this and really look at um, that erosion and what kind of uh, uh, management plan that they need to come together with on that. So uh, I guess we'll be hearing more about that. And then uh, they mentioned that as part of their budget development, they intend to put out uh, informational materials to the community, which is kind of a state of the union, just letting people know what they've accomplished with the funding that they have spent this year. And I thought that that was also a really good idea for us. And I know at the retreat, we looked at um, some of the graphic presentations of all the different areas where we put our attention. And uh, I think that probably our residents would be very interested in seeing something like that. So I was glad to take their good ideas. So that's what I have to tell you about. Excellent, Carrie. Thank you for the report. Uh, lots of good things going on uh, at our sister district. Definitely, and I saw Jay there getting them out of uh, technological problems. So he was he was their man on the job too, saving them when everything went black. That's great. And, and, and causing some technological problems. <laughs> oh, I didn't know about that part, right Jay. <laughs> well, great. Well, glad to hear that. Thank you for the update, Carrie. Uh, I too like hearing uh, good ideas that we can, uh, that we can copy. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Um, I'll, I'll share a report. I met with uh, Lieutenant uh, Jarrett Morris from the Foot Patrol uh, this past Wednesday. Uh, we spoke about a uh, number of things. I mean, there's been a lot of um, safety issues, of course, to talk about. And we were saying, you know, we felt like we've been in pretty close communication throughout all of that and are now looking forward to uh, a little bit of a, of a, a safer couple of weeks. And um, one of the things that we spoke about was, um, his interest in uh, the sobering center and um, seeing if there is a way for us to revive that project. And so um, I shared with him the proposal that had been put together a number of years ago and um, also uh, just had some questions for him about the utilization of the current sobering center, which we heard at our item last year uh, was not being utilized very much by Isla Vista Foot Patrol. Um, and um, it, so it was an interesting conversation, um, just, uh, and it, I came away uh, very happy to hear that it was something that he was, was interested in uh, looking at for the future. Uh, another thing that he mentioned was um, an idea about how to decrease the presence of, um, well, they're not, I don't think this is their real name, but I call them jail vans. Uh, we see them driving around on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, and uh, we know that uh, some of our friends and neighbors are sitting in them. And um, he has an idea for how to make them less uh, visible, I guess. And so eager to hear more about, I guess, uh, the details of how that would work. Um, and I think he's still kind of working them out as well. Uh, but I just wanted to share that. Any other uh, reports? Director Bertrand. Can, can I ask a question instead? Or maybe Ethan's yeah. also asking a question. But... Go, go ahead, Director Freeman. Okay. Um, is I, One thing that we used to have um, uh, was uh, nearly continual participation in our meetings from somebody from the Sheriff's Department, um, whether it be the community resource deputy or um, the uh, lieutenant. And I've noticed that we've not had anyone at our meetings a few months. I don't know if that was something that has come up at all or something that, uh, yeah, anyone's heard about anything from. Yeah, it, it hasn't been something that I mentioned in, but I will bring it up at uh, future meetings. Director Bertrand. 
Yes, thank you. Um, a couple of points. Um, so one, on a positive note, um, I learned that the Isla Vista Elementary School uh, PTA is having a jogathon this coming month. Uh, they're reaching out to a lot of community organizations to sponsor. Um, it's great to see that type of positive event happening in Isla Vista um, and always want to help get the word out on that. Another thing, um, if you haven't already seen the 2022 point in time count um, results are out. Uh, I know I uh, got to participate in that um, along with a number of you and uh, Sydney was my partner in Isla Vista. That was an early cold morning, um, but it was good to be out there and um, interface with community members in need. And uh, while we do see an increase in Isla Vista, um, we also know that we now have um, the Hedges House of Hope uh, named in honor of our former colleague um, that's housing so many people um, that previously was not there. So that's part of the increase um, because it does include both sheltered and unsheltered. Um, but uh, that being said, it's a sobering reminder of just how many people are experiencing homelessness in our community. Uh, we know that when we look around um, our downtown area in Isla Vista, it's not uh, nearly the situation that it was during the worst of the pandemic, um, but we still do have a lot of work to do on that side. Um, and then lastly, I'll mention that um, as many of you may have seen, there was an article in The Independent by um, a representative of the Santa Barbara Tenants Union uh, that spoke about um, the topic of rental increases uh, during a state of emergency, which um, here in Santa Barbara County, we've been under a state of emergency um, pretty much since 2017 between fire and debris flow and um, pandemic and uh, other uh, other emergency conditions, um, we have maintained that state of emergency. And certain jurisdictions are looking at um, how uh, rent has risen during that time because there are um, rules in place that prevent um, certain rent hikes. Uh, so it's interesting to see this local discussion about if uh, the rent has increased locally faster than it's been allowed to do, uh, given the circumstances of the states of emergency. Uh, so I was in touch with uh, Director Aguilar on that, and um, it'll be interesting to see uh, what our local jurisdictions do in response to these inquiries. Uh, but there are other Southern California jurisdictions that have been taking decisive action. And all I'll say is, um, I know that our Isla Vista rents have risen much quicker um, than would be allowed if those protections are indeed in place. Um, so looking forward to learning more about that. Thank you for sharing that, Director Bertrand. Um, and I will add, I appreciate your comments about the point in time count results. I, I think in the past we've gotten a presentation from uh, Community Services Department um, about the results of that. And, and so um, I'll reach out to them to see if that's something that's going to be happening again, because I think that it's really good information uh, that is good for the public uh, and our board to hear. Director Deschler. Yeah, just make a comment about that. I, I read the Newshawk article today. Boy, I'm plugging Newshawk today. Um, so uh, I, I, I read the article today about the point in time um, uh, count and because one of the comments in there was um, homelessness increasing and people living in their cars um, increasing in and around UCSB campus. And so I was surprised by that because there was no homeless count on UCSB campus. So I think that was just an error in the press release. But I did, um, I did talk to um, community services and um, they said that the report would be publicized and available um, after May 5th. So FYI on that. Thank you for sharing that, Director Deschler. Okay. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to our next item, which is, and I'm sorry, I lost the agenda, uh, is this reports from standing and ad hoc committees. Any committees have items to report? I'll just say for the Spring Festival ad hoc committee, um, I think my, myself, Carrie, and, and Catherine uh, have continued to participate in Deltopia planning discussions uh, that UC Santa Barbara Office of the Vice Chancellor of Administrative Services has been hosting as well as the Associated Students and the Office of Student Life. 
and um, we uh, have gotten to hear some good uh, information. Um, I don't remember if it, this was current the last time that we had our board meeting, but the uh, Associate Students Program Board is going to throw a concert uh, on the campus at uh, the Thunderdome that is going to happen in the evening of Deltopia. And uh, just in line with uh, what has been done in the past, help give uh, UCSB students uh, something to do after hours on uh, the day or the evening of Deltopia. And uh, I was really glad to hear that. And uh, big thanks to all of the students that are working hard uh, on making that happen. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we did learn that um, UC Santa Barbara uh, is going to be foregoing the vast majority of fencing that we have seen in the past during Deltopia. There will be no fencing um, put up uh, in the medio, the median on El Colegio, as well as at the uh, Camino Mallorca uh, campus um, property that is adja adjacent to Camino Mallorca, where many people park their vehicles. And uh, the only fencing that's going to be put up is kind of, it's a little bit far, far away from Isla Vista. It's around the um, uh, the, San, the Phelps Road uh, in the city of Goleta. And there will be no fencing around uh, the on-campus dormitories as well. And I know this is an issue that our board has taken a strong position on in the past in support of. And uh, I just really uh, want to thank the um, UCSB for really taking such leadership on this to make it happen this year, because um, I think that um, it is it's such a positive step to um, be able to move to this place where we really are in a transitionary period for what the Deltopia weekend looks like in between our concert, all the work that's being done by associated students, uh, as well as uh, other UCSB departments, including the recreation department, uh, with some of their programming that will happen on the Friday before Deltopia, um, it really feels like there's a lot of positive energy to move beyond what we've seen in the past. And uh, so uh, just a big thanks uh, to all who have been involved in those planning efforts. Director Aguilar, go ahead. Yes, uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that the parking group, uh, we will be meeting with uh, via Zoom, some staff from the California Coastal Commission. Um, I believe that's in the first week of April in which we'll all be talking. Um, so yeah, continuing to have important conversations. Thank you for that, Director Aguilar. Any other reports from committees? I'll just make a comment, Spencer, and in regards to um, your Deltopia update, I, I'm I, I'm always one to say, yay, UCSB, but um, but um, it was really in Santa Barbara, um, it was really Ivy Foot Patrol who initiated the conversation about fencing on Camino Mallorca and said, you know, this is the year to to, to, to kind of take down the fencing and, and see how it goes. So uh, it really came from leadership of, um, of the Lieutenant Morris. So um, we work really closely with the Sheriff's Department and, and, so, and we're always happy to do less fencing, but it was, what, it was definitely with, um, in working with um, Deputy Morris. Thank, thank you for sharing that, Kirsten. That, that is very true. Any other uh, reports from standing or ad hoc committees? All right, uh, we will move to a report from district council. Thank you, President Brandt. Uh, two quick issues. One, it was great seeing everybody in person at the uh, retreat this weekend. Uh, it's good to finally have that opportunity uh, to shake hands and to be in the same room together. Uh, second is uh, a number of my districts have been asking about uh, elections information. I, I know this uh, board is pretty well plugged in. Uh, those of you who uh, are up for re-election uh, this year uh, or any members of the public who might be interested, uh, the county is uh, in the midst of their process for the June primary, uh, but typically the deadlines are about 84 days to uh, on out to about 120 days. So once the June uh, primary elections are done, uh, district elections material should be coming out in probably the end of July or middle of July. Uh, and the submission uh, deadline is usually the first or second week of, of August. Um, so that's kind of the rough deadline for those who are interested in running. Uh, you can start looking for candidate papers to be pulled uh, sometime in the summer. 
uh, and for those who are running again, obviously right around the same time uh, for the November uh, election. And that's it, that concludes my report, thank you. Thank you for that report, Council, and uh, it was great to see you in person as well at the retreat. Uh, thank you for being there. Next, we're going to go to report from General Manager. So I don't have a huge amount to report. It was mostly the retreat and the festival for the last two weeks. Um, the UCPD I met with about the new uh, updating their MOU, and they're going to be asking for a, a funding increase for the interpersonal violence investigator, at least, just a heads up. And um, yeah, the Spring Festival is almost done. Just one change, I guess, is uh, we decided to get some uh, cheap paper wristbands with some branding about the event and our logo on them to hand out the week before and the day of. Just to, it will help track how many people end up coming in a way and just another way to pull people in to it. Uh, so that's a new thing for that, but it's a uh, band list is done, door hangers done. So we're ready to go. Um, and we're meeting with the park district and the fire and the police on Thursday for the walkthrough. So, um, and the audit is done finally. It took a long time this year, but we have zero problems again, um, only one, which is a suggestion to track the UUT uh, more closely from the from the agencies that give it to us. But otherwise, no issues in our accounting and finances. Thank you for sharing that, Jonathan. Any questions for Jonathan? Yes, Director Deschler. Um, this isn't a question. I just, I'm remiss. I really wanted to give a huge um, shout out of appreciation to Jonathan um, and the rest of the staff for the work that you all did to make our Saturday retreat happen. It was so great to all get together. Um, I literally couldn't even sleep that night because I just was so excited by all the things that we talked about and just the, you know, just hanging out with you all. <laughs> it's a nice way to spend a Saturday. But mostly I just wanted to say, Jonathan, um, you did a huge amount of preparation and that preparation, the, the work that we were able to do on Saturday was a direct result of the work that you did to get us prepared to have those conversations. And so I just want to tell you thank you and thank you to the staff for being there. It was just um, really great to feel like that really we're all on the same team kind of thing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Director Dashler. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. That was a lot of work. Uh, I, I really want to echo the thanks to Jonathan and also uh, to the rest of our staff who also was there on a Saturday and gave such great feedback. I, I really felt like we were able to get really good sort of synergy to like have some of these discussions where it's a little bit harder to on Zoom or in the shorter meeting format where we have to be you know prompted by these very specific items uh, to give feedback. So I really appreciate everyone for being there and for uh, all your work on that. Any other uh, questions from board members? All right, well, seeing none, um, future meeting dates and agenda items. I think we mentioned the future agenda item of uh, forming a group to uh, coordinate with uh, the Goleta Valley Library as one. Um, and uh, I also wanna bring up, I know we got this public comment um, about uh, legislation and asking us if we would take a position on it and um, i'm wondering if that's a good cause for the legislation committee to meet sometime soon um i know I'm, I'm trying to remember the members i know kirsten's on it uh and i also know she's busy with other legislation right now um but i i'm trying to remember if uh other who the other board members on it are i'm pretty sure i'm on that board or committee We've okay. never met. This is so exciting. <laughs> I think I might be on it as well, but we need to look back because I, I could be wrong. <laughs> it's I know it's, I'm not on it to help my process of elimination. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, that's good to know. Well, I think it would be good for us to check out uh, those bills and uh, potentially other pieces of legislation that could impact us as well. Um, I think in the past, Council, you've sent to us like the CSDA 
uh, positions or something like that, which I'm sure I think we have access to that just on their website and can go check it out to see what legislation they're tracking as well. Okay, um, with that, then our next meeting is going to take place on April 12th at 6 p.m. here on Zoom and in the community room. Um, and Jonathan, can you uh, explain how that's going to work too for the public? Yeah, it'll just be um, an option to come in person or to join on Zoom. And if you were on Zoom, it'd be almost exactly the same as it is now. Great. Uh, super glad that we've got our technology to that point. Big thanks to Jay for helping us uh, get those cameras set up and make that possible. It worked really well at the retreat. I went back and watched some of it uh, uh, after the fact and it was great. So. Well, I'm sorry, where, where are we going to be located again? It's going to be the community center or the community room? The community room. Okay. So it sounds going to be a lot better for anyone who experienced the community center with the birds chirping and the woodpecker peckering in the uh, wind. It was, it, it, it might fit its job of trying to isolate things, but it was. I think it, it was so nice. Much <laughs> I think we should use some of our one time funds for pizza as, <laughs> as, um, for people who attend, not us, of course. <laughs> well, well yeah, I think it's a cool thing. And we should all read a book to get that pizza. <laughs> okay, um, so with that, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Made by Freeman, I see a hand for a second from Topliff. Any further comments from the board? All right, let's do roll call vote. Uh, Director Brandt? Yes. Director Topliff? Yes. Director Deschler? Director yes. Freeman? Yes. Director Aguilar? Yes. Bertrand. Yes. All right. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Thanks. Good night.